Darren Dalton is an actor, writer, and producer who made his film debut in Francis Ford Coppola's The Outsiders as Randy Anderson. He was also in 1984's Red Dawn. Since then, he has appeared in numerous movies and television shows, including Highway to Heaven, Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman, and one of Albie's favorites, Alien Nation. As of late, he has become a prolific screenwriter and producer, but we know him best as Duck from Quantum Leap. Albie got a chance to sit down and talk with him about Duck, Quantum Leap, and his career. Hey, how's it going? Uh, pretty good, pretty good. Thank you very much for uh, talking with us today. Sure. We'll just start out by um, asking you a little bit about Quantum Leap. Okay, great. It's been a while since I've seen the episode, so you know, hopefully you'll refresh me a little bit. All right. Well, you played Duck. I did. I do remember the name Duck, which is the you know my little my little boy. It's the only sound he makes is quacking. So I mean, it's, it's dear to me. <laughs> Isn't it great to have a little one? It is. It, it is. It's really. It's the best thing in the whole world. It really is, man. I agree with you on that. Uh, your son's name is Jack. Jack. Yep. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, mine's uh, Serenity, and she's just a couple months older than your kid, I think. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty name. That's a very pretty name. Have you gotten any sleep yet? Uh, we're just starting to. It's, it is light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> good. It does get better, <laughs> little, little by little. Okay, good. Can you tell me a little bit about your experience filming Quantum Leap as much as you can remember? I know it was 25 years ago. Um, you know what? I remember. I remember. I remember it being a fantastic experience. You know, Scott Bakula is a pretty awesome, dude. You know, I remember bits and pieces. Certainly, I, I remember the audition process pretty well too, because it was an interesting one uh, for the character. Um, it was one of those ones. You know, when you're young and you're doing like crazy things, it was one of those times when I I walked into the audition room, and I think the audition piece was just the the speech that I give about the you know military industrial complex. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I, I, I barged in and I gave everybody this angry speech about the military industrial complex. And then I barged out and I, I just went, I just kept going, went right to my car. <laughs> and it was one of those times where, you know, your heart's beating and you're like, what did I do? What did I do? I should have stayed there in case they wanted another take or whatever. But by the time I got to my car, by the time I got to my house, it was a message on the machine because this was message machine time. And, uh, they said, listen, we, we, we loved it. So you're, you are now duck. So I remember that, but I, I also very vividly remember the fight scene at the end because uh, Mr. Bracula is uh, is not someone who necessarily holds back. Right. And so we got pretty crazy with the fight scene, crashing things around in the lab there and stuff like that. But I, I, I remember a lot of it. And I remember Stacey Edwards as well, who starred in the episode, was just a wonderful, wonderful, talented girl and things like that. It was just, it was, you know, it's one of those horrible jobs where you're working in Southern California on beautiful days and, you know, the food's good and everybody's happy and it's just fantastic. Do you uh, like playing the bad guy? Because uh, that seems to happen a little bit when you check out your IMDb. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, it's funny. It's, a, it's, it's the way it kind of rolled out. You know, Duck was a little bit badder than I normally would play. You know, usually I get stuck in somebody that's a little bit more uh, like in the outsiders, you know, there's, there's, there's a little, a little gold there in the heart and there's uh, you know, red Dawn, there's a little bit of a victim there and things like that. But the uh, stuff was just straight up, uh, you know, had some bad intentions, but uh, it, it can be very liberating to play the bad guy. I got to say it's, it's, uh, it, it's fun. It's not necessarily the way I roll in the real life. So every once in a while, it's nice to just go out there and be a little evil. Uh, you mentioned Red Dawn and Outsiders, probably two of the things that you're known for the most. Yes. Could you uh, tell us about those things? Because that's very exciting. You know what? Those are still ones that people people really love. The Outsiders is such a close the book. Was so, it's so close to so many people. And that, that movie, just it's got such a fan base even today that's crazy. And such a beautiful, wonderful film. It was the first thing I ever took part in. And it all pales by comparison after you do that. Your first... Your first gig, that's a pretty tough one to follow up. But great cast, still guys that I'm in touch with and things like that. And then, uh, you know, Red Dawn, who doesn't want to go play Army in the mountains in New Mexico for four months and go through training and, you know, fire guns and take out the Russians? It was another just fantastic one. And, and both of them have uh, fans that are, are somewhat can be uh, pretty passionate about the films themselves. Certainly the Outsiders does it. And Red Dawn, you know, you, you constantly run into people that are kind of saying like, that could really happen, <laughs> you know, and stuff. So it's a, mm -hmm. uh, but, but uh, both of them, great directors, Francis Ford Coppola with the Outsiders and John Milius, who's a great writer and director uh, that did Red Dawn. I actually just took part in a wonderful documentary they made about 
Mr. Milius, called Milius, that if you haven't seen it, you should really check it out. It really shows you. I think the, the, the tagline for it was the greatest filmmaker you never knew. And it's true. He's, uh, you know, he wrote Apocalypse Now. He wrote Jeremiah Johnson. I mean, he did, he's, he's just a fantastic guy. So, you know, ultimately, when you get in those movies, and especially when, you know, you're younger and you're, you're in these ensemble casts with all these other young guys and you're in some small town in America, and uh, it, it's, it's a pretty good time. Yeah, I just watched those two movies last night, and like you said, the cast is crazy. Crazy. Everybody's in it. Yeah, I mean, Tom Cruise, you know, popping up there, and you know, the, the secret there that was interesting that you just don't see anymore these days, and it was not something that I experienced since then, really, you know, and that was three decades ago, is the audition process was very different for, for both of those films, but especially for The Outsiders, because that was something where they brought everybody in, they put everybody into a warehouse all together, and they, you know, they improvised, and they, Francis Coppola would say, okay, you play this role, you play this role, and everybody would get up and do scenes, and everybody was together, and and I think uh, at the time I was going to high school in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I, I was flown out to these auditions, and I was just so blown away because it was the great people of that time. It was the Scott Bayos, and it was the you know it was Mickey Rourke, young Mickey Rourke, all these people, and it was an amazing experience because normally, like nowadays, you walk into a room, you get your five minutes, you you know you walk out, and this was a lot different experience where I think I probably put in about. 50 hours of audition time for The Outsiders and, and really never so much read the role that I got. So it was, I think, finding that cast, but it's not a, it's not an, an accident that that cast is so fantastic and everybody's moved on to have success in the business and some of them phenomenal success. So I don't think it's a, it's not a, it wasn't an accident. It was really an effort that you don't really see much these days to, to put that cast together. Now, later in your career, besides acting, you have uh, done some uh, writing and producing like you written the screenplay for The Land That Time Forgot. That was uh, one I enjoyed. Yeah, you know, uh, writing was always the root of the passion that I had for films. It's the thing, now it's pretty much exclusively what I do. Those films like The Land That Time Forgot, the things that I did, which, you know, I did in kind of pretty much in conjunction with uh, with C. Thomas Howell, with Pony Boy there, you know, so who, who I've I partnered with uh, often on films. And uh, that was for a company called The Global Asylum, who brought you the cinematic pleasure Sharknado. Sharknado, yes. And Yes, and those films are, I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of like boot camp. You know, you, you go and you write them in about uh, a little less than two weeks. You shoot them in a little less than two weeks. And you're working with very small budgets. And, you know, when you're working with a small budget and you need, you know, Nazis and submarines and dinosaurs, then that can get a little bit uh, difficult, but it, it can also be very fun. And, uh, you know, it's not, uh, it, it's certainly not going to be having any Academy Awards for it, but, but the truth is, is it's a, it was a really good time. It was something that taught me a great deal about filmmaking and certainly independent low budget filmmaking, but uh, ultimately it was a good time. The things that I'm doing now are a little, you know, a little bit uh, on a little higher level. So it takes a little bit more time, but I'm just, the last two couple of years, I've gotten into television writing, and that's starting to be pretty exciting. And uh, it, it, it's really where my heart's been the whole time. It was, you know, was when I auditioned for The Outsiders, and it still continues to be. Could you tell us a little bit about some of your latest projects that you're working on? Well, there's a lot of top secret stuff going on here, man. Okay. Um, I, it, it's a, it's but stuff that I would really love to break to you guys when it ultimately happens. Um, we're right in the thick of what's called pilot season. Uh, you know, there's different pilot seasons. There's ones for, uh, you know, when you're an actor, there's a pilot season that's earlier in the year. That's when you're getting cast and, and making the new pilots. As a writer, there's a season uh, when you're going out and you're, you're pitching and, and people are, are looking for those pilots that they're going to buy that then those later those, those actors will make. So, that's kind of, we're right in the thick of that, of that right now. I'm also working with uh, C. Thomas on another project as well called Countdown. It's an awfully fun project, kind of an Armageddon type of project with a, a large family element to it. And we also, you know, we have a couple of other projects where we're meeting at Universal, a lot of projects. So there's, uh, there's a lot going on. But uh, when there's something solidified that I can uh, tell the world about, then I'll get back in touch with you guys and, and break it on the, on the podcast. All right. Do you get a lot of people that uh, come up to you and recognize you as uh, your favorite character? And has that ever happened as your Quantum Leap character? 
<laughs> you know what? There's some people, you know, because I, I was lucky enough to do some sort of iconic, a lot of iconic television work. Uh, you know, I also did a role on uh, Highway to Heaven, for instance. And, you know, there were a lot of people that loved that, like they loved Quantum Leap. And I played Custer on uh, Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman. A lot of people like that as well. You know, so you get that every once in a while. You get the people that are really kind of the diehard fans. I get more people coming up to me and, you know, wanting to know why I tried to kill Johnny or, you know, <laughs> call, call, you know, calling me a traitor or whatever it is from the, from the larger movies. Yeah. But I, I always, I always love it when, you know, like you guys, for instance, I love it when somebody has a passion for those television shows, you know, quantum leap is such an amazing show to me. The guy that developed, that created the show, Donald Belisario is someone who I'm such a fan of. I was a big fan when I was a kid of the original Battlestar Galactica which was uh, Donald Belisario as well. And I just thought that Quantum Leap as well was such an inventive idea. And obviously you're working with two great actors because, I mean, both those lead guys were so fantastic. I, you know, I was just a fan of both of them, and it, it, it was a really good time. So I love it when I get somebody that comes up and says, hey, you were, you know, you were the terrorist on, uh, on Quantum Leap or whatever. Then it's, to me, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's always a little, bit, you know, a little bit more rewarding on some level. Do you remember while you were filming that episode of Quantum Leap, it's kind of like a heavy issue with Vietnam and homegrown terrorism. Do you remember it being like a serious thing on the set or was it, you know, that was the material and you had a fun time besides that or was uh, like the main topics of the episode not even brought up? Well, I'll tell you, you know, it's it certainly wasn't the climate that it is now as far as terrorism goes. And, and it's an interesting uh, it's kind of parallel there between the post-Vietnam era and the post-9-11 type of things, you know, but it was very serious for me. You know, I mean, obviously, when you play a role like that, you can't take it too lightly because if, if you don't have a passionate kind of uh, dedication to what you're talking about, then it's just going to come off as, as uh, not so great. And it was an eye-opening role for me because... I grew up in a small town. I wasn't really, and I was a little bit after the Vietnam era. I was very young during that time. So I never, you know, the military industrial complex and all that stuff, I didn't really get too much exposure to that. Um, so it was really exciting to me to learn about that. That's one of the great things about acting is you get to kind of, you know, completely immerse yourself in these, uh, these characters. And that's another thing about playing the bad guy. You know, when you get to immerse yourself in something that uh, if you did it in real life, you'd be spending time behind bars, then it's, it's, it's fun. And same, same with, you know, you do a war movie and you get to pull the trigger and, and somebody goes down and a squib goes off and the blood flies and things like that. You experience these things without having to deal with the, the reality of it, which certainly I wouldn't want to deal with, but, uh, it was, a uh, it was an interesting role for me because of that. You know, again, if you if you think about if somebody had done that that episode now, you know, somebody planting a bomb in a school locker and you know things like that, it's it would be a lot heavier issue. But you know, Scott took his job very seriously on the episode, and everybody took their job very seriously. So we had a lot of fun, but it was something that we were really committed to. You know, again, the the speech in there that Duck gives was something that I, I had to really find a, a passion for because it was such a, it, it called for such passion. So it was, it was something that I, I felt pretty, pretty heavily about. And, you know, I mean, who doesn't feel heavily about, even now you look at the, you look at the situation of veterans and, and, and the wars that we're in now and, and the veterans coming back and the difficulty there, it's still an issue that has a lot of impact and it probably, probably always will and always has. So it, it's one of the things I loved about the show. It wasn't fluff, you know, as, as much as you're having fun with these, you know, the other guys got to have a lot more fun. The Stuart Fractons and those guys that were the frat guys, mm -hmm. they got to have a lot more fun than Duck did. You know what I mean? But, uh, <laughs> right. um, but I thought that uh, but that show had a great balance of it being entertaining, but also having in issues and, and, uh, and stuff behind it, subtext that, uh, that had, some, had a little bit more weight to it. You know, so I was happy to be a part of it. Do you think Duck was doing it because he really believed in ending the Vietnam War, or do you think part of it was to get the girl? You know, I think initially he was there for the war, and then, you know, and then ultimately maybe his ego was a little bit bruised by the fact that uh, he couldn't get the girl. I think that's certainly part of it. But, you know, I mean, that's that's kind of the way it goes in life for a little, you know, when you, when you read about a lot of people who get into messy stuff, you know, you... You have the best intentions going in, and then and then things get a little bit ugly. But uh, you know, I, I uh, Stacey Edwards kind of cute girl, man. I, I definitely would have uh, definitely yes. would have gone a little crazy. Very cute girl. 
<laughs> are the technical things uh, in acting, like uh, the fight scene you mentioned with Scott Bakula, or like getting shot in Red Dawn, or just uh, being pushed through a fire, is that stuff fun for you, or is it just another part of the job? You know what? A lot of the time, it's a great deal of fun. But, uh, you know, you, you have enough to deal with as an actor to hit your marks and make sure the light doesn't, you know, you're not covering someone else's light and doing all these things when you're just having a walking and talking scene. So when you ultimately start mixing in things like punches and broken glass and, and gunshots and squibs and things like that, then uh, it gets a, it gets tricky. It becomes a very precise situation and much different than you'd think. You know, it's the same. A better example is a love scene because it's so awkward. You know, because you're you know you have to kiss in a way that makes sure you don't cover the light that's supposed to fall on her eyes and things like that. And it, it just all feels very awkward, but I love the physical stuff. I loved the fight scene in this because there was a great coordinator, and uh, uh, I like to do as much of that stuff as I can. Um, obviously, you know, you get some great stunt guys in there. They'll step in and, and uh, do some amazing stuff that you could never do, although I always found that maybe it's just the way my hair is, but I, I always found that there was always a bad wig on my belt. <laughs> so it was, always, it was always terrible. I could always go, oh, my God, that's a horrible wig. But, uh, um, you know, something like, being shot in Red Dawn was an interesting experience because, first off, it was extremely cold. It was below zero, um, so they had a lot of issues with uh, with the. When I say a squib, a squib is a you know is a blood pack that has a, a an ignition device uh, underneath it. So you have a wire that goes down your leg, and when they when they hit a button, then it blows the you know gives you the gunshot, right? Mm-hmm. So the problem that they had on Red Dawn was it was so cold that the blood was freezing um, in the pack. So they would hit the squib and it wouldn't go off. It would, it would just it'd be a black hole. It wouldn't really look like somebody had really gotten shot. So you're standing there getting ready to do this very intense emotional scene. And you've got a couple people over there with, uh, you know, with hair dryers, you know, blowing a couple of areas on your chest to keep it warm. It's one of those things that gets a little bit more difficult to... Uh, to emotionally connect with, you know, because, I mean, that's that's certainly the biggest uh, challenge in film acting is many times your most emotional moment, you've got a camera six inches from your face, and that can be a, you know, maybe you can't even see your act, your, the person you're acting with. So there's there's always that challenge, but I had a, an experience with that scene when, when I was killed in Red Dawn, which if you watch the scene, there's a very long, long take after I get shot. It includes when I get shot. I get shot, and then I go down, and then there's a very long scene while everybody else rides off on horses, and then Patrick Swayze gets on his horse and comes back and looks with tears in his eyes down at me, and then rides off into the distance. And, and, and the director wanted you know, him to ride quite a ways into the distance. So I was laying there, and it, it's sub-zero. Again, it's, it's very cold. And I'm laying there with my face down in the snow and uh, ultimately with my face away from the camera because obviously you still have to breathe when it's that long, so you fall with your face away from the camera so that your breath isn't seen. And um, I had, you know, we were very hyped up on that on that movie. We listened to a lot of apocalypse now in our trailers, and we really got into being these soldiers. And uh, I had a kind of a flip out moment. I remember uh, where a very long take, and I kind of started to, you know, just mentally my uh, my head went to, you know what? What if those people that I'm watching right away are really are the people that I'm with. What if there's not a camera behind me? What if it's all for real and they're leaving me behind? And, you know, my, my, my brain started to play the trick on me and I really had to, to force myself to stay down, not instead of turning my head to look and make sure that it was all a, all a movie. And, uh, I remember ha- having a very strong emotional moment of, of, wait a minute, maybe this is, you know, maybe I'm kind of screwed here, you know, but, uh, you know, and then somebody yells cut and then, it's it's all, it's all good, but it's it especially when you're young, you you get so emotionally invested in those movies, and, and Quantum Leap was the same. You know, I mean, you have to get so deeply emotionally invested into those characters that you're playing that uh, that ultimately you're you're going to experience a lot of what they experience. As a actor who is now writing a lot, is there anything things like that that maybe you have have experienced while you're acting that you just won't write now because you don't want another actor to go through that? No, 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 no. I think it's just. I think it's the opposite for me. And now, now, let's torture them as much as possible. <laughs> no, I, I, I think I don't think as an actor when I'm writing. I mean, I, I, 
I think that, you know, I, I, I try to write characters that I think actors would love to play, but ultimately, and, and maybe it's similar to what we were just talking about as far as acting goes, um, you're so invested into the whole thing emotionally as a writer that you're not really thinking, at least while you're doing it, you're not thinking, uh, you know, well, this is this is going to be tough on the actor, or this is going to be, but, you know, afterwards you might look at it and go, oh, well, man, I gave somebody a very difficult job, but uh, even with as much acting as I've done, I'm always amazed at the depth that actors can reach, you know, because, because of some of the, the technicalities and things like that that you have to deal with, so... I really just try to write things that ultimately they can invest that emotion into on a realistic level that they don't have to do too much, but that is real, that has some dimension to it. So that it's, it's easier for them. That's probably the, the, the thing that I think about from a, as a writer, from, from the actor's perspective is I want to make sure that it's as easy as possible for them so that they can go as far as they can. All right. Uh, we have a silly question about the episode. Sure. Um, okay. The necklace you wore, in the yes. Quantum Leap episode, is like a puka shell necklace. Was that specifically talked about, or is it just something that they threw on you because it appeared in another episode? So we were just wondering if that was something maybe a costume designer had in mind or something. Well, it was certainly something that the costume designers gave me. Um, I think that they were just really trying to evoke the, the period, you know. Um, but that was one of the fun parts about the about the that show is there were so many cool period things happening. I remember some of the clothes were pretty ridiculous and crazy. And, uh, and you know, it was one of those shows that, you know, the pants were cut so high that you were just like, oh, my God, what am I doing? <laughs> but uh, um, the puka shell necklace, I remember being, maybe they kind of planned to, to run that through the episodes and things like that. But, uh, but I remember very specifically them saying, you know, and you're going to wear this. So, I don't know, it could be a, what do they call them, a, an, an Easter egg or a, whatever, the, one of those hidden, hidden symbols. Very cool. Thank you. Um, yep. Is there anything else you remember from your time with Quantum Leap but any, or maybe any funny stories that came as a result of being connected with Quantum Leap? I don't, you know, I don't know. It's, it, you do something like that, you do a, a, a guest starring role on that, on a, on a show like that that's a, it's only a single episode. And unfortunately, it's, it's far too short. You get some good friends and you get to know some good people. But, but for the most part, you know, about 10 days of your life, you're doing that. And then it's kind of it moves on to something else. And, and uh, like I said, all I remember is just fantastic actors, great people, and uh, wonderful director, great director on that on that episode. And I have remained friends with some of the people that came out of that. Like I said, Stuart Flack and a great guy who played uh, one of the dudes that was uh, that was hanging out with Scott. So it was a great time, but it just, you know, you know how time is, man. <laughs> but, but, you know, and you know, like you, I know, I know you have a child of your own. I have a 15 month old, and believe me, I, I'm having a hard time remembering what I did yesterday. Yeah, sleep to uh, <laughs> sleep deprived, and also uh, the time is moving yeah. so fast. Uh, how, those last 15 months, how fast have they moved for you, right? Oh my God, it's crazy, you know, because uh, I still haven't adjusted to just having a little tiny baby, and then suddenly when this when this little guy walks into the kitchen and scratches his stomach and looks up at me like. You know, like I owe him money. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 it's, it's amazing to me that it's, it, it does go so fast. Suddenly, he's a little boy. You know, I, I was looking at him today, as a matter of fact, and just thinking, this is and suddenly is a little boy with the baby. So, uh, it, it, it's, it's an amazing thing. But you know, there you go. I mean, that's how fast the last thirty years have gone. Well, <laughs> thank you very much, and I uh, really appreciate it. And thank you so much for taking the time. You got it, man. Anytime. Thank you, man. Thank you, guys, uh, and good job on the podcast and keeping uh, the leap alive.